Hi again, students. Dr. Dillard here. Let's do week three CVPP lab. And this would be the lab for Wednesday. So it's going to be over the how to take the carotid pulse and how to listen for bruise. And then blood pressure exam, the way the board books stay to do blood pressure testing, which is different than how you learned it. Right, so palpation and auscultation of the carotid arteries is up first. So to examine the carotid arteries, the patient should be seated. Make sure you get informed consent. Examiner should be on the right side of the patient. And what are you palpating? Very nice anatomical picture here. So you are checking this thing out right here. This is the common carotid artery. This is actually the right common carotid artery. Is that correct? Yeah, that's the right side. And notice, remember, the carotid artery splits right here. This is actually a really nice anatomical drawing. It's got the carotid sinus in the right place. Notice the carotid sinus is just above laryngeal prominence. And we've seen quite a few cadaver specimens, and sometimes it varies. Sometimes it's at the level laryngeal prominence. Sometimes it's up a bit higher. You want to stay off this. You don't want to palpate this because the patient could pass out, right? If you push into this, it's going to stimulate the nerve of hearing to release the tiger cage out of the vasomotor center, right? Or it's actually... It's going to re, it's going to send out more. It's going to stimulate the nerve of hearing, but it's going to cause more nerve inflow into the vasomotor center, and that's going to lock the tiger up. And without the tiger, parasympathetic will rule, and nitric oxide will rule, and you get a really quick vasodilation of the blood vessels throughout the body, and the patient could pass out because the blood pressure could drop. So you don't you want to keep your fingers off that if possible. It's pretty rare that it happens, but it could happen. The patient could hit their head. Anyway, so it splits into an internal carotid and an external carotid. So when you get up in here, you're palpating probably the internal carotid artery more than anything else, but you might be hitting the external as well. A lot of times in lab is not that specific. It's just going to say palpate the carotid artery, and that would be the whole thing collectively. Right, so that's the, there's the vertebral artery back there. All right, so that's our little anatomy review. And the jugular vein is over the top of that as well. That's the external jugular. Internal jugular is in the carotid sheath uh, with the vagus nerve and the common carotid artery and et cetera. Carotid sinus, I just told you about that. There it is. See how this anatomical drawing is wrong? It's not at the split. It's it's at the start of the internal carotid artery is where the carotid sinus should be. But here's the nerve of hearing. There's chemo bodies in there we're in interested in, but here's the nerve of hearing, and it, it's a branch of the glossopharyngeal nerve. That goes to the tiger cage, and we've talked about that a lot. Don't push on these again. Patient could pass out from decreased blood pressure. Pushing stimulates the carotid nerve of hearing, or the nerve of hearing, and that is that is inhibitory on sympathetic outflow. All right, the examination procedure. So they want you, this is Bates, uh, wants you to palpate it right here where the clavicle is. Do I have a picture of that? Is that? Yeah. So Bates wants you to palpate it. Well, that's the first rib, but the clavicle would be right coming across here. Uh, so they want you to put your fingers right there the best place to try because that way you're way away from the carotid sinus. So that's the ideal place. If you're in boards, that's the ideal place to find it. Does that work? It's pretty hard to find it. Some people can find it. I can't find mine there. I have to go up to the second spot. Uh, but at the clav clavicle, and you can go between the sternal and clavicular heads of the SCM muscle, the number two spot is up at the ramus of the jaw, Oh, they have the jaw cut, but it would be right up in here, about. Here's the mandible coming. Uh, oh, here it is. There's the angle where the ramus and the angle is. So uh, uh, that's a little anatomically off the way it's pictured. Um, but I'll, I'll show you on the person here in a second. But that's the number two spot. And so that's the best place I can get mine. You want to slip your fingers just 
medial to the SCM, but keep this finger in contact with the, the mandible, and then both of them can try to palpate it. You don't want to use three fingers because you might hit the carotid sinus that way. Right, so those are the two places. I mean, if worse comes to worse and you got to get the pulse, then you could go right in the middle, but you're in danger of making the patient pass out. All right, this is from uh, Bates. Bates uses the thumb here. I don't know if I would recommend that. It's probably better to use two fingers. There's some older evidence about a thumb pulse. Uh, it's okay to use it on the popliteal like we talk, finding the popliteal artery uh, because we can actually see the skin moving to confirm it's not your own pulse. But nevertheless, Bates uses it. I mean, it's fair game to use then for boards if Bates uses it. But I would go like this and see the fingers are, it, they could be down a little. The clavicle is right about here. So you could slide it down just a hair. Uh, and then the, the other place you could find it is up here. You could put your two fingers right up here. One, two fingers. This is why I don't draw. That's the other place. That's the number two spot. That's the number one spot where to find it. If you got to go in here and put two fingers, I mean, if you have to find it, if you're a traffic accident scene and you got to find it, then go there. But you could really drop the patient's blood pressure. So if they're in internal bleeding, you don't want to do that. If you're you know, work, if you're an EMT or something, I'm sure they train you not to do that. Anyway, all right. There's a picture of Cetal. Uh, so the fingers are right up here. They could be up even a little bit further. And laryngeal prominence would be. I don't know if that's laryngeal prominence. I think it's probably. Well, maybe it is on her, uh, but you're pretty safe up there. This is where I can find it. This is by far the easiest place to find it, I think. Why do you pal Why do you take the carotid pulse? Good place to check for heart rate. Uh, you can feel the strength of the beat uh, as well as you palpate. Uh, I mean, there's some things if they have valvular, if they have aortic stenosis, right? That's like blood can't get out of the left ventricle, and you may feel a decreased pulse strength, or maybe you could barely even palpate one. Um, so left ventricular failure could do the same thing. Anything that causes a decrease of flow out of the left ventricle uh, will affect this crowded pulse. Hypovolemia, hypovolemic shock, also decreases the magnitude of the pulse. You might be even able to feel a thrill or a brewery if you feel a cat purring, uh, that's called a thrill. Uh, remember, a brewery is the same thing. They're both turbulent blood flow, probably from a beaver dam, a long beaver dam, where the blood is really flowing rapidly through an arrow of, area of narrowing. And if you can feel it with your fingers, that's called a thrill. It feels like a cat purring. If you can listen, if you can auscultate it with the diaphragm or the bell, uh, then you call it a brewery. You don't call it a a thrill when you're oscill uh, a brewery is an oscillatory sound only. All right, so uh, now this is, you know, which do you use, the diaphragm or the belt? You really should use both. According to Bates, which is the oldest board book, and I, you guys know I like to teach you what the board books use to ask you questions. Uh, so the diaphragm is probably better for picking up breweries because most of them are higher pitched sounds. Uh, but the more dangerous, severe ones are actually lower pitch because of the decreased blood flow. And so you might miss it with a diaphragm. Uh, so if there's any risk factor, if they've been getting lightheaded, uh, things like that, and you really want to do a cervical manipulation, you better check this artery out good. You better use both the, the diaphragm and the bell. So if I ask you, if we're back in school, if I ask you to auscultate the carotid artery, Make sure you hit all three spots, and you can um, you can do it with start down here. This would be number one. Or auscultation doesn't really matter. And if I said that I could say that I want you to palpate the crowded pul or, or the crowded pulse, you would do number one down here, number two up here, number three up here. But if I ask you to auscultate, it doesn't really matter. Just to make it easy, I would do the same order. Just number one down here, number two up here, number three here. But for auscultating, it doesn't really matter which way you go. Uh, but don't forget to use the bell and then use the diaphragm. Use both of them because you might miss the brewery if you don't use both. Okay. And yeah, that was in Bates. I used to just teach the bell only because I was still told to use Jarvis. 
I'm slowly rewriting these notes purely by Bates and Seidel and uh, Bates and Seidel both said the same thing about that. So you're going to have to double auscultate it. All right, uh, let's see. What else do we need to do? Specifically auscultate the upper, middle, and lower carotid artery. You should have the patient hold their breath too. Tracheal sounds are really loud, especially when you're using the diaphragm, and it'll interfere with hearing the, the pulsation. So have the patient take a breath and hold it while you do the auscultation. What are you auscultating for? We already said bruise, turbulent blood flow. That's like a whooshing sound, whoosh, whoosh, whoosh and it's caused by anything that causes a beaver dam, atherosclerotic placking, which narrows the lumen. How much does the lumen have to be narrowed, you might be thinking. How much? Easy number to remember, 50%. If the, if the aorta is narrowed by 50%, you get a decent chance of hearing a brewery. Sensitivity and specificity aren't good for it, though. It's not the greatest technique. It's always better to order an ultrasound if you're really in doubt. Nevertheless, it is test on the boards, and it's part of you're doing your due diligence to screen for these any placking. So make sure you know how to do this stuff. And let's see what else I got. We got anything that causes maybe it's a tumor pushing on the uh, on the carotid artery. Um, yeah, maybe maybe they have an embolism that's causing the beaver dam. Anything that narrows blood flow putting your finger over a hose and getting turbulent blood flow that way. So what if you hear a brewery? Well, it could be it's probably atherosclerotic placking and they better go get checked out. They might need to have their artery cleaned out. You certainly don't want to do a, any kind of manipulation on someone who has indications for brewery in their carotid artery. If you do a manipulation, you could break that plaque loose and uh, stroke them out, which would not be a good thing. Right, cervical manipulations, contraindicated, carotid massage. If they're having some type of supraventricular tachycardia and you want to do carotid massage, you better you better auscultate before you do carotid massage. Make sure they have a brewery because you could break it loose by rubbing around in there and you could you kill the patient, right? Uh, so it's an important technique. And that's all we're going to talk about that. Let's go to blood pressure now. You guys are pretty good. Although the procedure is a little different, I'm going to show you both. Even Jarvis, all three board books say to do it exactly like I'm going to teach you. So they've taught you kind of a modified technique that you've learned so far, uh, which I um, don't know where it came from, but it's not the board books. But, I mean, it's fairly similar. So we'll see. Uh, let's see. So what is blood pressure? It's a measurement of the force that heart-ejected blood, blood squirting out of the heart, puts upon the blood vessels. And that highest force during maximum systole, that's called systole, systolic pressure. And there's still a pressure there because of the elastic recoil. It's called diastolic pressure. The difference between systolic and diastolic pressure is the pulse pressure. Okay, hypertension is defined. I know you've learned a lot of variations on this. It's a little early yet because it hasn't made it to the board book, so they won't be asking you that. They won't. They can't ask you. They have to only have these board books as references, right? Because I know because I've been there. And so hypertension is easy. It's 140 or above, over one or 90 of above. So systolic hypertension, if you have 140. Uh, if you have pressure 90 or above, you have diastolic hypertension. If they're both over, you have hypertension, right? It's great risk for atherosclerosis, great risk for the development of PAD, which is just a beaver dam type of atherosclerosis. Malignant hypertension, that is dangerous. You refer to the emergency room, that's hypertension. Is blood pressure 180 over 120, medical emergency. Hypotension is defined as anything less than 90 over over 60 and I mean some athletes have pressure lower than that so I really think they should bring that one down but NIH and other sources that's what it's used for what increases blood pro uh, pressure I like our blood pressure I'd like to write questions on these right here there's something called the white coat effect WCE 
Uh, and some people are very, very nervous around anybody with a white coat, including you. Chiropractors are primary health care providers, and they get nervous around you as well. And in fact, you could go visit them, and your blood pressure might be quite a bit higher than it normally is. And if it's an MD, and they're, of course, to you know, wouldn't wouldn't do this extra testing. They just put them on meds, or maybe they try some diet at first. Uh, but if you think that they're anxious around doctors, before you put them on meds, you can put them uh, take have them do a twenty four hour monitoring. There's like an automatic blood pressure they can put on their arm, and it takes the blood pressure when they're at home. And twenty percent of people coming into a doctor's office, according to research actually have a white coat effect. Uh, so if it's high, maybe it's not really high, so don't just run and put them on meds. Check them at home. What about masked hypertension? This is a weird one. This is just the opposite. Some people are normal at the doctor's office, but high when they get home. Uh, so 20% of the population is thought to have this. This is not good. These people stressed out at home some people feel comfort. It's comforting to be in a doctor's. You feel safe with a doctor. Some people uh, may may have that feeling or safe to be in a hospital. Um, but these people have a great risk for cardiovascular disease and even uh, heart attack and other kidney disease and things like that. And then, of course, hypertension. Sometimes, not, in fact, 95% of the time, we have no clue what causes it. We have some theories, uh, but that's called primary hypertension. 5% of the time, it's called secondary. What's the number one cause of secondary hypertension? You guys have read, listened to my other video on that. You should already know the answer. Renal artery stenosis turns on the R2A system. Uh, what increases blood pressure? What else? Uh, arterial stenosis from atherosclerosis. Yeah, if it's real widespread... Especially, especially one called arteriolosclerosis. Remember, arterial sclerosis is, this is the parent category, and it has three children underneath. It has arterial sclerosis, atherosclerosis, and one called arteriolosclerosis, which arteriolosclerosis is a problem with proteins getting into the tunica media and decreasing the size of the blood vessel. That's the number one cause of hypertension, uh, but it's always overshadowed by atherosclerosis. And why that is, I have no clue. Um, but anyway, so any type of stenosis can cause it. Uh, what if you're super uptight all the time or you just naturally have tiger running out of the vasomotor center? You have increased sympathetic tone. Those people can have hypertension as well, especially systolic hypertension. Uh, renal artery stenosis, most common cause of secondary hypertension. Yeah, uh, that, that could be a cause as well. Hyperaldosteronism, getting the uptake of salt and water too much. That can do it. Decreased arterial, uh, arterial um, compliance. What's that one? Oh, that's getting old. Right? Compliance is stiffness of the artery. Uh, and so as you get older, the tunica media, you lose that stretchiness of the arteries. And it's, when you get a, when young people get a big blast of, of blood coming out of the aorta, it stretches and it dissipates some of that pressure. Older people don't have that, and therefore the pressure is much higher during systole. Uh, so that can also cause blood pressure. We'll talk about that more in class as well. How do you take the blood pressure? Let's go through this. Again, this is Bates and Seidel, the board, back, board recommended text. This is right where it comes from. Go to the library if you don't believe me and read it yourself. Um, blood pressure is measured with a stethoscope and a sphygmometer, sphygmomometer. I can never say that. Sphygmomanometer, sphygmomanometer. That's a mouthful. Yeah, it's this thing. It's the cuff. And then you need a stethoscope. So nice, easy board questions you should know. What's, how do you determine the proper cuff size for somebody? Well, you measure their arm. So if you take their arm circumference, you take 40% of that circumference, and that will give you the width of the bladder portion of the cuff. Bladder is a little rubber 
tube that's inside here. Bladder doesn't go all the way to here. This is where the Velcro is. So the width of the cup, cuff should be 40% of the arm circumference. 80% of the arms for circumference is the length of the bladder. It's not the length of the entire cuff. Everybody good with that? Too loose, too tight. These are easy board questions. I could put, it looks like we're probably going to be doing the midterm, I'm thinking, uh, uh, via computer. Uh, so these are the kind of questions I like to ask. What if the cuff is too narrow? and you pump it up. That'll give you false high reading. False high reading. Uh, because there's not enough, if this is your, this is your artery here, and you're, oh geez, that's terrible. It's, it's late, I'm doing this as a late video for me. Uh, so if you wanna compress this artery with a blood pressure cuff, if the cuff is, we'll, we'll make it ridiculously small, it's going to be harder to close the pinch this tube off. It's going to take more pressure. If you have a gigantic cuff that's this big, it's going to take very little pressure. You have just a tiny bit of pressure will clamp down in this vessel because there's so much surface area connecting to it. All right. So if the cuff is too wide, you'll have a pressure reading that's too low. If the cuff is too narrow, uh, you're going to have a fault, so you have to pump that thing up like crazy to get it. What about if the cuff is too loose? That's the one you guys never know, that one. You ever, you ever for fun, pump up a blood pressure cuff and see what happens to it? Uh, let's see, where should I draw this? So it's just a rubber bladder, and normally as you pump up the blood pressure cuff, the bladder gets bigger and bigger. But at a certain point, it starts to become pointy, right? So if the cuff is too loose, you will overextend the bladder, and it will be like this is the only part that's going to connect to our artery. So it's like having a cuff that's too small. You're going to get a false high reading with a cuff that's too loose. All right. Um, patient preparation. Patients should be calm. They shouldn't have just had coffee in the morning, uh, been smoking. I mean, that, those are all artificially raised blood pressure. Uh, exercise. They shouldn't have done that for a while. Have them sit in the room. I mean, if this is, say you're taking blood pressure and this is the third try, it's been high in the other two times. And if, if it's going to be high this time, you're going to put them on meds or send them to the primary to put them on meds. Um, make sure they're calm and relaxed and let them sit there for a while and get bored and uh, so their sympathetics are all turned off. Side note, you should always take blood pressure bilaterally. A study came out 2014 by Weinberg, uh, quite famous actually by now, and it showed that if there was a difference of 10 millimeters of more, more uh, in either systole or diastole between the right and the left, they followed those patients for 13 years uh, to see, and then they had a group who had normal bilateral blood pressure was the same. They followed them for 13 years. The ones, and then they followed people who had hypertension for 13 years, uh, but it was normal from side to side. The strangest thing is the patients didn't matter who they were. If they had a lopsided blood pressure, they were at increased risk for heart attack and stroke and death, 38% uh, higher chance. So that was a significant study and they don't quite understand the how that is or why that is probably atherosclerosis but so do it bilaterally all right so arm presser this is the procedure by Seidel and Bates this is a two-step procedure you're going to step one you're going to find the cutoff pressure what in the heck is the cutoff pressure here's our artery what's the cutoff pressure Good. So if we, what are the colors? I always forget what colors I have, pink. What if the, uh, the, the blood pressure cuff is wrapped around here? Cutoff pressure is when this cuff, you pump it up and you find the pressure where the cuff actually squishes the blood vessel down to nothing, pinches the blood vessel. 
So no blood. You And you're listening here with your stethoscope, and you can hear the blood uh, pulsating, and then all of a sudden, it's gone. Uh, why? Because you just you just clamped it off. And that's the cutoff pressure. That's the pressure needed to stop the flow uh, of blood. Okay? And that is typically going to be systole. Right? That, that part right there. Uh, so then, once you find the cutoff pressure, we'll say it's 120, it also gives you a number that you should remember. After you find the cutoff pressure, you let the air out of the cuff and relax. Okay, and then you're just going to take the blood pressure quickly without stopping and monkeying around. And you're going to know to go 30 above that. In the real world, I would go 50 above that because some oscillatory gaps can be 50 millimeters of mercury. Most of them are 10 or 15 or 20. 30 is a safe number, but some have been reported at 40 or 50. So anyway, you're going to pump the cuff up to 150. How do you know that? you got to get the cutoff pressure first. You guys are taught a one-step procedure. I guess, I don't know what the purpose of that is. To save time, I guess. Um, I sure wouldn't do that if I was taking the boards. I would do it just like the board books say to do it. It's a two-step procedure. Uh, so that's what you're going to do. And then you're going to take it after you let them rest for 30 seconds. Then you're going to put the cuff on. You don't have to take the cuff completely off. Uh, but you're going to put the cuff, tighten up the cuff, and go. And you don't have to put your ear pieces in. You don't have to do any more pulse taking because you already know the number you're going up to. All right, so that's where we're going. So definition of cuff pressure is the point which you can no longer palpate the brachial pulse. Uh, or if you have a Doppler ultrasound, the no, the point at where the brachial points doesn't the, the pulse doesn't make a noise anymore. Why? Because you've smashed it and there's not enough blood flowing through it to make a noise. And why? What's the whole purpose of going 30 millimeters above? Because people with hypertension have this weird phenomenon called an oscillatory gap. And it's a silent period that is somewhere in Karatkov 2 and it could fake you out. And I'll, we'll leave it at that until we get to that. So step one, put the cuff around the patient's arm. Right? The artery marker should be lined up with where the brachial artery is. Brachial artery is in the crack of the elbow. It's the cubital crease. It's not in the side of your arm where the bicep is. All Even Jarvis, Bates and Seidel, they always say it's in the cubital crease, just medial to the bicep tendon. So that's where you find it. The inferior border of the cuff, how high does the cuff go up? It should be about one centimeter or one inch, two fingers above the cubital crease. So two fingers, the tightness should be two fingers. And so you should be able to slide two fingers in uh, for tightness and it's two fingers above the cubital crease. All right. So here is the YouTube video. I'll give you the link to this. I'm not going to make a new one, but I'll show you exactly how the board books say to take blood pressure. So uh, it, I don't think when I, I did a blood pressure CCP before, and I don't think I ever saw anybody put it on too tight. It was always too loose. So make sure you get it tight. Uh, arteries lined up over the brachial artery. I could have scooched it over maybe a little bit. Brachial artery is right about here. Um, yeah, and then two fingers this way. There's the cubital crease right there. So that's the perfect height for that as well. All right. Now, how do you take a blood pressure? It's best to remember right on right. So if you're right-handed and you're given the choice, take use your right hand. Your right hand or your right arm will come under their forearm. You'll also pinch their right arm uh, between your arm and the side of your chest. right? And then give the ball, the pumper-upper with the valve, give it to your right hand. And if you have the valve, my valve is up here, but if you have the valve on the, on the pump, on the ball, you can still see it through this little hole right here uh, when the time comes. So let the right hand, that's the one that's got all the coordination, and it's hard to let the air pressure out. So you want to use the right hand to do that. Uh, once you do that and lift up on that and straighten the elbow out, then you bring down, and remember, we're just step one. We're finding the cutoff pressure. We got the cuff on correctly. Uh, we don't have, you don't even have to have the stethoscope on. 
can have it laying on the table. Uh, once you have the arm and the ball in position and you lift up and lock the elbow out, then bring your two fingers down right to the medial part of the, the bicep, right in the crack in the cubital crease, and start fishing around for that radial or brachial artery. Might have to go even further medial. It's, his was just pounding. Mine's pounding. Uh, when we do this in class, in person, it always amazes me. Uh, the lights come on and people go, oh my God, I can find it, I can find it. Because I know a lot of you guys fake it, right? When you have to push your fingers up under the bicep to find it, there's nothing to trap the artery and compress it against. Maybe a guy with pretty big biceps it's pretty e might be easy to find that way uh, because you can trap it against the bicep, but normal humans without huge biceps, it's pretty hard to find it. Plus the cuff is there. So you, what do you stick your fingers underneath the cuff? It's just weird. So in my opinion, and I, the way the board books say, right here in the cubital crease is where you take it. Okay, enough said. Make sure you lock the elbow out. People who can't find it, don't straighten the elbow. You have to trap the artery against uh, against the humerus, the, the medial condo of the humerus there. Okay. All right, uh, so find the cutoff pressure. Now, once you're in position, let's go back to the picture. Okay, I found the pulse. Now, what do you do now? Pump the thing up. So pump, pump, pump. We go up, up, up. I can still feel the pulse. We'll get up around 20. Whoa, I, where'd the pulse go? I can't feel it. That's because you just completely cr crushed the artery. That's the cutoff pressure. That's going to be systole probably. And, and you know, fish around for it. And don't pump up so far you jump over it by 20. Go up. When you get up around 100, slow down. Little baby pumps. And find out where the pulse, where you lose the pulse. And if it's a 120, write that number down. Because you're going to go up to 150 then. But you're not going to do it right now. The technique they teach you in school, now that you find the cutoff pressure, you you take your hand away, you put your stethoscope in, you put your stethoscope down, you f a lot of you are fumbling around and wasting time. Uh, and if you leave this on, it messes up the reading. So you don't want to leave this on, and that's why this is a two-part procedure. There's, uh, there's research on that. So let's back to the style. You found the cutoff pressure, that's it. Let the air out of the cuff. You can leave the cuff there, but let the air out. Let the arm down by the side. Now count about 30 seconds. You're going to put your stethoscope in your earpieces in your ears, and you're going to get ready to go. And now you're thinking, okay, I'm going to go up to 150. You're not going to do any more palpating or anything like that. All that stuff is over with. Okay? So after you found the cutoff pressure, you're done. You just know you're going to go 30 above that. Let the air out of the cuff. Let the patient relax for 15 to 30 seconds. Now, uh, let's see. Right on right, I already told you about that, how I'm, I'm kind of controlling his elbow by jacking up my forearm. If you remember right on right, and it comes, that's your right side, your right arm, and their right arm all go together. And that leaves the left arm completely free to palpate the pulse. Right? I'm showing you the cutoff pressure for him. I think it was up a little higher than that. Um, but I could still feel the pulse, so I had to go up to where it disappeared, probably around 110. Uh, and this one of my grandsons, who's all grown up now. Uh, okay, so now you're done. So you've waited 30 seconds, and you're ready to take the blood pressure. So put your earpieces in your ears. And this is Seidel and Bates. They want you to use the bell. I don't, personally, I don't like the bell, and I don't think you would have trouble at the boards using the diaphragm. But if you want to do it the way the board books say, you should use the bell uh, because the pitch is low enough that the bell picks it up really good. All right. Uh, so got everything in position. Just pump the thing up to 150. Go as fast as you want. You're not palpating anything. You're just pumping up to 150. So I got, I'm using the diaphragm in this case. Um, could have used the bell. I guess you should use the bell. I've always used the diaphragm. The bell's always a pain in the butt. Um, but you really should use the bell. And yeah, go. My little hand is squeezing. I'm off to the races. My job is to get up to 150. And then take the blood pressure. Let out the air once you get up to 150. You don't have to do any more palpating. Okay, let the air out slowly. How fast? That's always the question. How fast should the air come out? 
two to three millimeters per second. What the heck does that mean? You're not gonna, you don't have a watch. How do you figure that out? If you ever notice when you're taking blood pressure, how the needle bounces on the way down, it should bounce between as you're going down from 150 to 140 to 130. It should bounce three or four times within that 10. If it bounces five or six times and you've went from 150 to 142, it's too slow. So it should bounce three to four times is the correct speed. If you say 1001, 1002, 1003, you should be down. If you're not going down fast enough, you need to let more air out. It's another common problem. People go too slow. All right. What's so... We're up at 150, and everything is silent. You're going down, down. All of a sudden, you hear boom, boom, boom. That first beat, boom, that you hear, that systole. That's also known as Karotkov 1, okay, or phase 1 Karotkov. Karotkov 1, I call it. Then you keep listening, boom, boom, boom. It muffles and changes. And then all of a sudden, you get a muffling, that muffling sound is actually first diastole, but we'll come back to that. I'm just saying the way you take it now, and you already know this. Uh, and the, the, the boom, boom, boom gets quieter and quieter, and the last boom you hear, and then you don't hear anything, that last boom was diastole. That last boom was at Karotkov 5. And so you record, the first boom was at, at 120, so you record 120. And then you record diastole was, well, let's say, down 70. So that's good blood pressure. Now, the difference between another great board one. What's the difference between first diastole and second diastole? That last boom that you heard, Krotkoff 5, that's actually second diastole. When I went to school, that muffling sound indicates Krotkoff 4. Krotkoff 4 is called first diastole. That was probably uh, up around 75. It's where that muffling occurs. That's second diastole. So they used to use second di or first diastole. Sorry, that's first diastole. Uh, first diastole is that muffling sound where that occurs. right? So first diastole is up higher. And second diastole is the last boom you hear, right? First diastole is also called Krotkoff 4, right? So you got to just kind of memorize that slide. So they used to, this is more accurate reading of what the blood pressure really is. But the trouble is the interrater reliability is terrible. People aren't very good at hearing that muffled sound. And so... Powers above the World Health Organization and all the powers above and NIH, they decided, you know what, we better use second diastole as the diastolic number because people are pretty good at telling when that last boom was. So that's kind of the story between first diastole and second diastole. Make sure you know that because I do like that. Uh, here's just a kind of nice cartoon. Here we pumped up. So this is the amount of pressure. So we pumped up on this guy up to 160. His cutoff pressure was 130. So we're way up here. We open the valve, and it's going. The air is going out. Boom. That first boom is crack cough one. That systole. Boom, 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 boom. And then it muffles. Boom, boom, boom. Nothing. The last boom you hear, that's crack cough five. That's diastole. Okay, I think everybody knows that. Here's another one. It's got this one's a little bit more accurate. It's got the diastyle, uh, dia, first diast diastole here, Krotkoff four, is where you get a sudden muffling sound. It's you can hear it. It's definitely distinct if you really look for it. Uh, you can hear the sound, and that's first diastole. But for us, the diastole that we report is second diastole, and that is. Uh, right there, and that's called Krotkoff 5. Got it? What about no diastole? What if you go boom, 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 and it muffles and it stays muffled forever? What's the deal with that? 
People who have aortic regurgitation, you can hear that backwashing of blood through the through your stethoscope, especially if you're using the bell because that's a lower type pitch, and you may not get a diastole that way. So what does that mean of no diastole? That means they have regurgitation of that aortic valve, most likely. Oscillatory gap. Again, the oscillatory gap is a silent period that typically shows up uh, between the first and the third carat cough sound. It, in other words, it's carat cough too. So, and somebody with an oscillatory gap, let's go back here. So, let's say... Well, uh, they usually would have hypertension. Let's say that's 180. And so, well, let's let's just wait. I have a thing coming. We'll explain it with that when the time comes. All right. So the oscillatory gap is a silent period in crack cough 2. So even though the numbers aren't right, crack cough 1 is here. This is all crack cough 2. That is completely silent. So if you don't pump up high enough and you start listening right here, you might end up in a silent period, and that's the oscillatory gap. All right, so you got to pump up high enough. Oh, here's my little thing. All right, so here we pumped up. This patient's blood pressure, systolic pressure, was way up here at 200. Uh, but for whatever reason, you only pumped up to 160. And so when you started listening, it was quiet. And then, then you heard, boom, boom, boom. So you thought the pressure was 150, when in fact it was really 200. It's kind of a silly uh, drawing. They should have really made this about 160 and then uh, and a little bit lower. But that's the point. If you don't go up high enough, you might miss this. And you might think that, okay, you're above Krotkoff 1, when in fact you're actually below Krotkoff 2, and you're in a silent oscillatory gap. Pretty good with that. And it's about, in general, it's about 5% of the population who has this thing. It's higher than that in people with hypertension. One study, uh, actually two studies, have found it around 20% people with hypertension. So uh, make sure you go high enough. You, you ever go to the doctor's office? How do they take your blood pressure? Does anybody ever do a cutoff pressure? I mean, I've been to the doctors probably more than all of you guys put together in the class. No one has ever taken my blood pressure, not even at Stanford, not even at Stanford Cardiology. They pump up to about 200 to make sure they don't miss a gap and then they come down. Or they use a machine and the machines detect blood pressure in a different way and they don't, they are not influenced by the oscillatory gap. The oscillatory gap is non-existent to them. So they'll never have, you'll never have to worry about that with a machine. Although the accuracy is not quite as good as doing it by hand. All right. Uh, oh, everything I said. So the oscillometric blood pressure, these automatic machines, uh, they take, they use pulse pressure. So they don't, they don't care if you have an oscillatory gap. That's only an oscillatory gap is just that. It's an oscillatory finding that's only seen with uh, this sphygmometer. Fun facts. So I read one paper that said that 2017 that you can eliminate the oscillatory gap by raising the patient's arm above their head for 30 seconds right before you take the blood pressure to find the cutoff pressure. So that's kind of interesting. And yeah. So there's just the crock cough sounds again. And that is the end. So please watch my how to take blood pressure video. I'll put a link uh, down in the, where will I put the link? I'll put it in my, the class announcements. And yeah, so we'll see you in week four.